Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm joined by Michael Kester. Yes, you are. And we have a goddamn show to do. We have a goddamn Killapalooza to do. Oh yeah, Killapalooza. Those happen. Those do happen. Uh, despite despite our, our better judgment. Yeah, even. I know. Well, we keep trying to not. Maybe this will be the one. Every time, I think for the past four or five Killapaloozas, we say this will be the one. maybe this will be the one that people realize. This isn't worth it. However, I, I mean, I know we've been talking about it, but there is Saw. I yeah. will go until Saw has been done. That's going to happen. That's not our next kill Palooza. No. Should we hint at the... Let's not do that. No. Fuck that. No one knows what the next kill Palooza will be, but there'll probably be one. So what are the movies that's going to make people no longer want to listen to a kill Palooza uh, ever again? Today we're going to cover all eight of the Amityville horror films. You'll you'll note that I noted. we're not covering the uh, Michael Bay mean? prequel. Okay. Um, that's because, uh, it's Did a Did you Michael say prequel? Bay. That's not a prequel. I'm it's sorry. a sequel. It's a what remake. What are you talking about? Oh, remake. I said it was a sequel. Yeah. We're so not ready to do this show. <laughs> well, anyway, we're not covering that because it's Michael Bay. Fuck that. But we are covering the eight films, which may or may not be about a house in the American Northeast. I'm going to go with may not. Can I'm, we just fuck the coy thing? I'm going to go with may not. We're gonna, not. How about are not? <laughs> we're going to learn about, uh, the Amityville hoax today, which uh-huh. is really the only real thing yep, I hope to that's accomplish. That's the meat. If you've never tuned in for a Killapalooza before, this show tries even less than all the other episodes, uh-huh. and probably succeeds even under that goal. But uh, I'm going to try and dispel some fucking hoax today. Sounds like a great I think time. the movies call for it. All At right. least three or four of them try sure. to invoke it. Sure. Uh, we're going to get to the origins of Ghost Cold. That's true. Which is something I have uh, I think always gets edited out of the show, uh-huh. but I joke about <laughs> all the time. And uh, we're going to have some self-serving announcements. Sure, that's right. We're also going to talk about... Um, uh, some aerial swine. Oh yeah, we got to get to that too. Oh, I forgot about the T-shirt. Okay, first things first here. Then, uh, this glitter mouse is doing oh, yeah. something. Wait, even better, one better. I forgot that I'm involved in this you too. Are, you're in- myself you're and glitter mouse involved. is doing something. So we're releasing four EPs. We just released the one. So and, when you uh, say we're, you don't mean you and I. You mean you right. and glitter mouse. I mean mouse. me and glitter mouse. Okay, we got to back right. up for a second here. So you're in a band. I'm in a band. I forgot. I right? forgot. Yes. Yeah. Nobody knows about that because we right. only talk about it at the end of the show. Exactly. And nobody makes it that far right. in any of our so, fucking episodes. So I'm in a I'm in a band uh, called Glitter Mouse. And a while ago on the show, we mentioned that we had uh, released an EP. Awesome. And we're releasing another one on April 1st. But then the following EP after that one, which will probably be sometime around June. This is insane. You're on what? Four EPs a year? Yes. Oh, awesome. Um, You are actually involved. Not only are you involved because you <laughs> wrote part of one of the songs. It was a basic line it's yeah. about 10 seconds yeah. of of the song but also you uh you did some serious work on a live video i did i did so uh a lot of people ask about this mm-hmm. actually and it never makes its way to the show because there's nothing really to report but we do these other projects yes. outside of double feature and you and i joke all the time about how great double feature is because we can promote our projects sure. and, which Vehicle we never, for other projects we really don't do that nearly Not as often as we should But uh, while you and I have worked on a lot of stuff together, and you have about 30 movie scripts sitting around (laughs) that I'm waiting to do stuff on, and we're just, you know, we're collaborating on all this stuff, we never quite get to the final product. Yes, exactly. Now, your products reach reach their destination. Sure, and so do yours. Right. We both make stuff, but none of the things you and I work on, I think because of this fucking show. Yeah, it's pretty much every time we get together, we talk about our other projects for just about as long as it takes to go, this movie would go with this movie. Right, And then we schedule for the next four or five years of double feature. Yeah, so we, we never get around to doing stuff. But uh, yeah, so I made a video based you off one of, your, uh, one of your live things. And um, and people love this because we get lots of geeky camera emails all the time. Mm-hmm. I shot it on a DSLR. Yep. On two DSLRs. I shot it on a, uh, a T1i and a T2i, which are really, they're pretty low end Canon. Anybody could get a hold of one of these things. I don't actually, I don't own either of them. Yeah. I borrowed them from other people. And uh, and we shot this song, and it's pretty awesome. I just finished doing the color on it. Actually, 
by the time this goes out, it will be on the internet somewhere. Yes. So probably, probably just glittermouse.com. Glittermouse.com. I, mean, com, I know right? that that's where I'm going to put it. I'm going to stick it in the show notes somewhere. I think Sweet. I'll put it on YouTube or Vimo yeah, or one of those. Stick things. it on YouTube for sure. So people can finally see something that you and I have worked collaborated on together. On. Fan fucking tastic. All right, let's get to these awful movies. Yes. Wow. I hope people actually watch these movies because then my dumb little video really looks fantastic. As always, there's going to be chapters. There's going to be a lot of chapters. So many we're, chapters. We're going to spoil the movies. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> what? It could happen. Uh, the first one is from 1979. That's right. The Amityville Horror. So we Also have... known as the Amityville Horror, it only goes down from here. I think yeah, I think it's, it's weird that's... because that's totally the case. And so I had seen the remake. I uh-huh. hadn't seen any of the other films. So you hadn't even seen 1979's The no, Amityville Horror. No. Awesome. And I, and I was expecting... 1979, James Brolin, Margot Kidder, the Amityville Horror, to be this benchmark in horror right. that it seems like it is. You you know you know the house, you know what it looks like, you know that it's the Amityville Horror is a it's just a it's verbal icon, staple yeah. when it comes to horror. When people hear the Amityville Horror, they go, "That sounds terrible," but <laughs> right. they don't realize what they're saying. <laughs> Well, I think it's because there's nine goddamn movies, That's and anytime true. there's nine movies, there must be some sort of history there. And then there's the sort of based on actual whatever, who uh-huh. fucking cares, and there's a book as yeah. well, Sleepy yeah. Nap Time right. uh, book for the Amityville Horror. Right. And so it's a it's a Stuart Rosenberg movie. It's the guy who did uh, the director of Cool Hand Luke. Okay. And you know what? Actually, I want to touch on a lot of the people who made these movies, if for no other reason than to hold them accountable. But mostly we're playing on that three point scale again. Yes, the back to children of the corn. Right, that's what it was. We uh we we invented what we we have it's seriously, it's comes up all the time. Yeah. Uh it's it's what we call a three point scale, which is we are no longer operating in the one to between ten. one to ten. Every right. film is a three. It's a matter of where on the three point yeah. scale it's going to fall. Where's that decimal? Yeah. yeah. Which is really, it's also great for double feature because it's a terrible name. Yeah. You would never figure out from, it's worse than the Hudsucker proxy. No one knows what the fuck this title right. means. So it's, it's the decimal point, right? We're not talking about if the film is a two or a five or an eight or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're talking about if it's 3.2 or 3.5. Right. Uh, what level of bad are we, are we dealing with? And of course, we're going to evangelize these films as if they're the greatest things sure. ever, because that's what we do on Double Feature. Any but, films that get a star is a good film for me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I believe the first two movies are the only ones, uh, as far as IMDb goes, that have anything greater than three stars. And honestly, that's surprising, because the second movie, I don't know if it was the version that we watched, mm-hmm. but it definitely looked like somebody made it in their basement. Yeah, it really did. But I think uh, because... Everything's in uh, full frame. It's in three by four after yep. the first movie. So that's the only one they made really for cinemas uh, or had the budget to get, you know, sure. 16 by nine, which was apparently hard, I guess. Yeah. The point is a lot of people showed up for the first. That's true. And some more people showed up for the second. Yep. And after that, no one really showed up, which is why I think you see those three stars. Sure. And I think I think that a lot of the reason that the first film is, it, I mean, it's obvious that this film was the, quote, blockbuster of the bunch. We have James Brolin, who is by no means a small-time actor, especially no, in 1979. All. Margot Kidder is Margot Kidder. I mean, I don't know how many people are actually familiar with Margot Kidder by name, but if Pigtails you... Pigtails and black and white skirts, Yeah, man. If you've seen a movie in 1970 or... Between 1970 and sure, 1985, sure. Margot Kidder was probably the hottest one in it. That's uh, that's kind of um, where you can let that... She was in Black Christmas. Yeah, so these guys are playing the Lutz family. So I guess this is as good a time as any to get into kind of the story behind the movie. But it's based on the Jay Anson book, mm-hmm. The Amityville Horror. And that book was kind of written as being based on a true story. Now, although the movie never says it's based on a true story, and I guess we should kind of give the movie credit for that. Although... I think they probably just forgot to include sure. that. In the, well, I I'm think sure it was just, on a post. I, I'm somewhere, guessing right? they just assumed that it was, you know, everybody knew. understood. Yeah, right. So this guy flips out and he kills his whole family, the DeFeo family. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, and they find the guy guilty and he goes away. And so this house goes up for sale. And one of the things that's really great, actually, is that uh, it was furnished. Uh huh. Because if you're going to prison sure. and you killed your whole family, yeah. no one's really around to... Sure. Well, they touched on it in, what was that, the uh, the Amityville Mirror, where sure. they were uh, right. talking about the, the one good thing about killing your whole family is that you get all the inheritance. Right, yeah. But if you, uh, if you go to jail, then you really don't get shit. So the house was sold furnished, which is actually true. The house was really sold furnished. 
And, uh, you know, there's some interesting stuff there to talk about uh, when you get into that James Randi area of, Dowsing. you know, not that one, the other one, oh. of haunted possessions oh, and okay. of how people feel, you know, uh, how people are comfortable with an item. And if they learn the item belonged to a serial killer, then suddenly they're uncomfortable with it. Right. So let me just cut to the chase on this. What happens is the uh, the Lutzes start talking to DeFeo's attorney and over uh, what what his attorney, um, William Weber was the guy's name, okay. his attorney. Uh, what I think he later said was a bottle of wine. Over mm-hmm. a bottle of wine, they concocted this scheme. They came up with this ghost story and they sold it to a publisher who hired on Jay Anson to write the book. And that's how the hoax got started. And so this is an admitted hoax. I mean, the, the Lutz family would never admit this because they have so much stock in it. But William Weber came right out and said later that, uh, yeah, we made this thing up over a bottle of wine one night. And later the Lutz family sued him. And we'll get to the very litigious uh, family here when we start to talk about some of the later movies. Mm-hmm. But that's our setup for what yeah. happened and why a lot of people think that, you know, the Amityville sure. horror house actually has some sort of history. Well, that's it. essentially the setup and teardown to why these films exist. Right. They right. exist because it's supposed to have happened. Otherwise, this film would not be anything more than the Haunted Mansion. Sure. Right? Well, and the, the coincidence there while you bring up the Haunted Mansion is it's 28 days, right? Sure. That they spend in the house, which of course makes us think about 28 days later in that right. franchise. Uh, and the movie breaks it down day by day, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Sometimes interesting, sometimes excruciating. Yeah, mostly excruciating. Uh, until it gets to the end and it cheats and it just says, fuck this, I'm out of here. So it's some kind of mix of, uh, I mean, what, The Exorcist and The Shining, right? You kind of do a little bit of Yeah, that's pretty much dead on. The Exorcist and The Shining with a little bit of uh, Fistful of Dynamite. So this is one of the most talked about movies and the hoax thing is really all I, sure. I cared to do. Yeah, we into. don't need to discuss the film. It's been discussed. The big thing I want to ask you, and I think this will be a, a reoccurring question we need to get to, okay. is what's really the worst thing that the house does? In okay, this movie? so can I can I just set this up really quick? Because this is our slasher, yeah. right? The house yeah. is our slasher. So we have, we have a Killapalooza and uh-huh. by default, Killapalooza has a recurring character that kills people. That's that the is, very definition, man. That is what we're doing with Killapalooza, is where we're watching a single person raise the body count. All right. Started with Jason, can't get higher than Jason, but maybe more interesting. Sure. So when presented with an inanimate object that's killing people, and that's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to say house. I'm going to say an inanimate object we'll that is that killing shit. people. We were forced to, instead of come up with the coolest kill, which, believe me, next Killapalooza, that's where that's going to be. Exciting. I'm excited. But we instead had to go, well, really, what's the worst thing that happened? <laughs> what's the worst the house could do? And and then this one, so so if I can just give my top three. Yeah, could we do them in reverse order? Yes. Great. So the worst thing that the Amityville house does in sure. the Amityville horror to the Lutz family. Number three. Well, I think we split here. I, uh, you say flies in a room. No, I say bleeds. Oh, I'm gonna go with bleeds. I, okay, I'm I'm gonna go with I'm gonna flies go with bleeds room? too. But oh. flies in a room was was honorable mention. Okay, then. sure. So number three is bleeds. The house bleeds. It's a little fucked up. Yeah, it's, it's messed That's, up. Yeah. and it's messy. Yeah, sure. Why not? Number two is invites the homeless over. Yeah, so a homeless guy shows up. Yeah. That's not cool. He doesn't Thanks come house. inside, but it's still inconvenient it's and weird. awkward. Yeah, isn't but, that weird? When I love this when people talk about actual hauntings and they say, "Well, how do you explain that?" Well, a homeless man shows up. Yeah. Well, that must have been the house, sure. clearly. And I think the absolute worst thing, and, and I will stand by this being I mean, possibly the worst thing the Amityville house does in the entirety of the series, is steals $1,500. Fucking jerk. That's so much money. Fucking house <laughs> for a caterer? I know, right? But the house later uses that. That's a beautiful tool, because later when we go, how did the house do these things? We go, how did the house, Where? Why is, who's paying the electric bill? Yeah, right. Fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars. Come on now. Are you sure it was only fifteen hundred? It was a one thousand. Oh yeah, because fifteen thousand dollars is basically what they paid for the house. Yeah. Back then. You know what's funny is they paid eighty thousand right. dollars for this house. Mm-hmm. So purports the first movie. The house sold in the last couple of years for I think over a million dollars. Wow. I wonder how much of that fifteen hundred was left. So we move on to Amityville Horror number two, mm-hmm. which is called The Possession. The Possession. Uh, it's a the nineteen eighty two film. Sure. And it, so we're talking about a completely different crew already. Yeah. We've already abandoned everything the first is, crew. Everything is different. It's written by somebody we've seen on the show before, uh-huh. Tommy Lee Wallace, who did, uh, he was both the director and writer of the movie It. 
Okay. Uh, very which was not on the movie. show. Right. But Halloween 3, which mm-hmm. we may forget as being on the show. I don't right. even remember what happened to Halloween that movie. 3 is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and it has it's to do like with some masks. It's like Illuminati. Sure. And this is where we really start to see some of those influences with The Exorcist. Um, sure. Well, and the thing about the second Amityville movie is it's remarkably similar to the second Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It is. This is, and we talked about it with Nightmare on Elm Street. So mm-hmm. go ahead, go back and listen to it, and you can kind Don't of discuss why. Don't do that. That was why. your one. Don't listen to that. But the one thing that I think is really strong about it is that it takes the ideology and morphs it in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. It at least comes up with an idea. I swear to God, this is the only fucking film in this franchise (laughs) Uh that comes up with an idea. All right, sure. And it's that the kid gets possessed by the house and then becomes the killer. It's it's Jason goes to hell. See, when you say Freddy, I start thinking Freddy playing video games. No, no, I'm thinking I'm talking uh, the kid that turns into Freddy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, Father Pecoraro, who was actually in the in the real life Amityville horror, he was the one who blessed the house. And unfortunately, he was never attacked by ghosts. Bummer. And he also says he was never attacked by ghosts. So Jay Anson thinks, well, we can't use his name because he wasn't attacked. Let me make up a priest. So that's where the, you know, the original priest in the first movie mm. comes from. Played by Rod Steiger. Yeah, a priest that they made up. Uh, they replaced him in that book and then in the, the story in the film. So we get even more priests, even more of the church in the second movie. And we start to really see where they're relying on the exorcist to sell the story. That was mm-hmm. what was really popular at the time. Sure. That was part of that era of horror. Sure. And we're just driving those things home. When you're dealing with demons, you have to... I mean, okay, so paranormal activity. When you're dealing with demons, you need people. Yeah. Because demons are invisible, apparently. Yeah, Fucking sure, whatever. Sure. So you need a priest as your protagonist because the priest can wave shit around and he can fight invisible stuff. Yeah, right. For right. some reason. And the rest of the family just has to kind of be annoyed, get pissed that their tablecloth is hanging on their wall. That's such a good shot, though. That is a I good have, shot. I have a soft spot in my heart for this film in the franchise. Definitely. This is, this is my second favorite. It reminds me of, uh, you know, you mentioned Black Christmas earlier. That's sort of April Fool's era sure. of horror. Well, it, it's got it's got the good 80s camp going. Yeah, it does. It does. And it has a lot of interesting stuff from a filmmaking perspective. It has those first person shots, you know, coming up from hell, coming up from the basement uh, where the the ghost or possession or whatever the fuck it is, takes a sheet and puts mm-hmm. it over the cross. Sure. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. Because if it could just take sheets and whip them around, why does it need to possess anybody? Uh, actually, I have the answer to that question, and it's for incest. That's true. So uh, we get we get what is possibly the most erotic incest scene I've ever seen in a film. Awesome. And that please send those to double feature show at gmail dot com. By the way, we're always on the lookout. But that also sparks possibly the strangest theme we've ever seen in a sure. Killapalooza, which is the incest theme. Yeah. And it we discussed back. briefly, we riffed on why maybe this is. Mm-hmm. And and I'm guessing it's because you ha- you have a house, and it's a big house. It's not an apartment. It's not Hellraiser 3. You have a house. So people that move in are going to be a family, and if the house is going to be torturing this family, the best way to do that is to fuck with the family, right? Yeah, turn them against each other. and Or turn them inside each other. <laughs> sure. That would have been so much dirtier outside of Akilapalooza, but I just I keep thinking about martyrs now. Or maybe the fly, right? Turn it inside out. Anyways, my point was, um, I don't think I had a point, just incest. Wonderful, wonderful incest. Yeah. I love seeing incest in movies because it's, you know, when we talk about taboos, incest is one of those taboos. I mean, you look at something like um, like legalizing drugs sure. or drug use. Drug use is kind of a general taboo. It's not very frowned upon talking about. It's not very touchy. Religion is a taboo that's more touchy. Some people are very vocal about it. Then you get into the John Waters area of sure. fetishes that most yeah. people don't talk about. Prostitution. Um, you know, we can move into some stuff on this show that's so taboo, barely anyone talks about it. And then there's incest, which I believe just I'm okay with. Yeah, I'm that- no, I'm totally okay with incest. So, so here's the thing, and and this this is probably the Do only. Do you have any idea of the trouble you've got conversation into? on the internet? about that's going to say this and and i want everybody listening before they freak out and and skip to the third slash end of this uh whole podcast fuck there's chapters aside from the biological effects of incest so let's assume safe sex like everybody should be doing anyway sure what's the big deal question mark 
Aside from the fact that it's fucking weird, I mean, I would never have sexual relations with anybody I was related to. Sure. However... You already have normal relations. Why right. do you need sexual ones? Exactly. But assume... Take, take for example, two people are born, a brother and a sister, separated at birth. They never see each other. Then they meet at a bar at an airport in L.A., like each other, find out they have a lot in common, go home and fuck. Protected, they don't have any babies. What's the big deal there? That's a really interesting question you raise. Of course, this is the worst place to have it, which is why we need to, to yeah. have that conversation here. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I'm not sure I can find a legitimate reason. Yeah, we'll get over all the creepy and whatever. Sure, That's it's taboos, creepy right? and it's gross, and I would never do it. Don't get me but wrong. But is it okay? Is it, the, I don't the see real... the problem with it. Sure. Like for the, It's the same thing. I would... I would never do drugs, right? Right. I'm not comfortable doing drugs. Sure. That's not a part of my life. That doesn't mean I don't think other people should be allowed to do it. I don't have a problem with other people doing drugs. I'd love for our audience to challenge that, though. If you could think of a legitimate reason outside yeah. of childbirth. Childbirth, I totally understand sure. uh, biologically why that's a bad idea. But um, I, th I think everything else is just social. Yeah. I don't think a rational, you know, a person who's, uh, who's talking about the hoaxes behind the Amityville sure. horror if you're um if you're okay with all the other stuff yeah. all the other taboos we're and talking i'd love about, to be why proven not wrong. I'm, yeah. I, I'm always happy to be proven wrong but honestly i can't find the answer great we'll stick it on the year-end show second request for emails double feature show at gmail.com so much like gore or violence or vulgarity when i see incest in a movie i totally revel in it i think fuck yes incest no one exactly is okay with doing sure. this now we're getting something that's challenging something that'll push people's buttons a little bit and the best part about the incest in this movie, and you're right, they do take it pretty far. Yeah. Um, they make it a pretty erotic scene. And I love how okay she is with it. Yeah. This isn't some kind of weird rape incest, it's demons. She's totally fine with it. It's this weird kind of naivety that she, he says, take off your nightgown. And instead, that would be the moment, right? Yeah. That would be the moment where you would go, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're my brother. But for some reason, she's too naive. Sure. Or maybe she just fucking wants it. And so she takes her nightgown off okay, just, just for, for a, a second. Yeah, right. That's a long goddamn second. My favorite part, though, and I didn't think I could have more of a favorite part after that happened. I didn't think it would get any better. But in fact, it does. Later, she confesses that he did it just to hurt God. Right. He did it How to hurt God. fucking hot is that? All right. Enough about incest. We need to talk about Skypig. Oh, yes. This is, uh, this is the uh, final... The final show of Sky Pig, isn't it? Well, no, Sky Pig comes back, and we'll okay. talk about Sky Pig coming back. You may forget, but there, there's not as clear of a Sky Pig. Um, they said in the book that there was a pig, uh, Jody, I think was the name of the pig. The pig has a name? That, yeah, that actually showed up, a ghost pig or something, uh, in the sky or in the windows of this house. And we do actually see, and I had to, to confirm that through the book to make sure, uh, but it is a pig. Mm -hmm. I was kind of just joking about it. It looks like a pig. But it's really a pig that they're showing in these movies that appears in the windows and appears in the sky. This demonic pig, these demonic eyes. By demonic, you mean red. That's really, that is all I mean. And so later they try and make us think that the eyes were actually the windows of the house. Mm -hmm. But we all know that it's Sky Pig. It's Sky Pig. Sky Pig is the slasher in these, the Sky in these Pig movies. Sky Pig is the, is the champion. And I think he appears in as many movies as the house does, so yeah, it's probably okay. I think that's okay. about right. I just don't know how the movie didn't use the Sky Pig Sky more. Pig would be awesome. Okay, explain this to me. You have a evil devil pig that floats in the sky. How do you not capitalize on that? You just show it in a window, that's it, it's creepy, leave it alone, time mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. How are we not seeing Sky Pig in every fucking movie? You're asking the same franchise that creeps a lamp across the floor. All right, so other than create the Sky Pig, obey Sky Pig, what's the worst thing the house did? Rain? Rain, a rainy. I think rain. I mean, Is rain the worst one? I honestly think rain is probably the worst. I mean, outside of the, you know, gumming up the toilet with black goo thing that yeah. the other and there's did. Yeah, the, and there's the possession and there's the incest, but that's all, you know, that's all, I can't really count comment on that. So I'm going to just, I have to go with rain. It exploded at the end. There were some fireballs explode. that came out, so that might be the worst thing the house yeah, did. Yeah, rain or explode. I'm still going with rain. Yeah, why would you have rain during your explosions, though? Doesn't that kind of... I guess it doesn't actually diminish the effect, but you want the house to burn to the fucking ground. Yeah, let's wait for the next movie. Poor planning. Amityville 3, otherwise known as Amityville... I can't even say it, man. It's Amityville 3D. God damn it. Amityville, oh my God, 3D. It's That's... not cute. We didn't let Jason get away with this. Amityville yeah. does not get a pass either. The very next year, we have another crew full of people 
to make this fucking movie. Although the um, the director, whose name I'm sure I can't pronounce, first name is Richard. He directed Red Sonja and Conan the Destroyer. He okay. did Soylent Green. Okay. Um, so he actually has some movies sure. that people have seen under uh-huh. his belt. Not this one, however. Maybe not a 3D movie. Sure. But, um, well, this one, this one is 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 kind of. First off, it's the end of the naming convention where they use numbers. Um, but I'll also, call it Amityville Horror Three colon 3D. But uh, I think the actual title is Amityville Horror 3D, and that does not count. Well, but see, it doesn't have horror in it. It's just called Amityville. Is that true? Yeah, it's called Amityville 3D. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. A lot of it has to do with the fact, with all the legality behind it. So this film has two major points. One is that it's an illegitimate bastard sequel. Sure. It's not allowed by the Lutz family or their right, their sure. descendants their or whatever. Their estate or whatever. The other thing is that it, it has the, it, it's also based on a book. It's based on a different kind of book. Well, yeah, so it's sort of Steve Kaplan's story. Mm-hmm. So this is interesting. Uh, the movie starts with a fake seance, which I guess is redundant because all seances are fake. Right, but this one has Ghost Rider. Uh, but it says a lot about skepticism and investigation. To me, it's a lot more interesting to look at why that might have happened instead of what the movie's trying to say about that, because I don't think it even really knows. Um, I would speculate that it might be the backlash from mm. the hoax. Sure. So we're talking about several years out Nine, now. This is 83. Yeah. So people kind of know the story. They're probably well-educated in knowing that it's a hoax. It's one of those things where, uh, you know, it's it's kind of like when 9-11 happened. Mm-hmm. And in the weeks after 9-11, there were a lot of hoaxes going around. And a couple months later, people got a better idea of the story. And so two years out from 9-11, well, let's look at now, you know, uh, almost a decade later or whatever, right? Sure. Uh, the only people who believe the hoaxes are crazy people. So there's a backlash against those crazy people, as we talked about on uh, Loose Change, the mm-hmm. Loose Change show, where we were part of that backlash because fuck 9-11 conspiracy people. So I think Amityville is experiencing the same thing. Sure. In a, in a smaller, and a less important With sense. more Meg Ryan. With more Meg Ryan. So this gets more into the real story. Kaplan was this guy who the Lutz family brought in. He's a paranormal investigator, and he was going to verify that their story was true and there were really pig hooves on the front lawn or whatever the fuck was pig going hooves on. Pig hooves on the sky lawn. To verify all these, uh, these claims that uh, they'd made. Right on. And so he goes in. And what's funny is, you know, this guy's a paranormal investigator. He believes in fucking everything under the sun, because that's just how that works. And he comes away from the house and says, oh, yeah, that's a hoax. I couldn't verify any of that stuff. And so the Lutz family was not happy with this at all. And uh, Kaplan eventually wrote this book, um, the Amityville Horror Conspiracy, I think it was called, talking about all these claims they made and how they couldn't possibly be true, how the evidence contradicted that. I think he was actually worried that the Lutz family and the Amityville horror story would kind of dampen, kind of tarnish the record, maybe. Tarnish the, the legitimacy of, of the, the bullshit. Par- yeah, of the paranormal yeah. investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're not talking legitimate Joe Nickel paranormal investigation. We're talking a crazy guy in the 80s paranormal investigation. So while he's running around telling you Bigfoot exists and UFOs landed here, he's saying, but that Amityville thing, that's too much for even me, which I love. So they bring in Ed and Lorraine Warren. Mm -hmm. Ed and Lorraine Warren were this couple of so-called investigators who would believe, I would say believe everything, but Kaplan believes everything, right? Mm -hmm. So they believed even more than Kaplan did. And um, we don't often enough plug uh, Rebecca Watson's show, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, but they described Ed and Lorraine Warren as thinking the Amityville Horror House was the second most haunted place in the world. Wait, but then where's the first place? The first place is Ed and Lorraine Warren's basement. Uh Uh-huh. What's the temperature in their basement? Or at the Amityville house? I believe it's ghost cold. Oh. This sounds super rehearsed, but you just know where this is going, right? It's ghost cold. That's it. It's Ed and Lorraine Warren. And they would talk about uh, how spirits leave leave behind... (laughs) Banshee Chills, breeze. Banshee breezes, a geisty gust. Ghost cold, man. So uh, you and I use ghost cold all the time mm-hmm. when we'll talk to completely rational people or friends of ours, and then we'll stumble across something where they'll say, oh, but ghosts, I believe those were real because there was one in my house growing up sure. or whatever fucking- When I was we, little, the door closed. We've been in the same room with these people so often. Well-meaning people that we love and respect that happen to believe- and goes for stupid reasons. Mm-hmm. And so those stupid reasons are called ghost, ghost cold. cold. Mockingly, of course. But there's a bunch of strange stuff in here. The Reveal magazine they talk about looks right. a lot like Skeptic magazine, sure. which is kind of odd. Uh, they use fucking ghost meters, whatever the hell that... 
you know those shows that all exist those uh-huh. ghost hunters paranormal ghost hunters whatever feel the wetness thank you south park yeah fuck those things uh, you know you run around with this scientific looking equipment it measures electromagnetism or what have you and suddenly it looks like you're doing something legitimate mm-hmm. right People see that on television and they go, well... Put a handle on your Game Boy and then you can investigate for ghosts. Gets back to dowsing, right? Yeah. You have something tangible in your hand. A twig is an item that actually exists. And if the twig is pointing that way, therefore dowsing must be an actual thing that exists. I I mean, you know, we have a meter and the meter goes up when you get closer to magnetic ranges. Sure. And so if somebody tells you, well, I don't know if there's ghosts, but I do have this meter and we'll see if it goes up. We're going to see. We're going to test it, right? That's totally valid. Sure. I don't know if there's ghosts. Let's test it. And so they get near some sources of electricity and the meter goes up and well, okay, we tested it. There's ghosts. It's so fucking fraudulent and I hate it. And so we, we fall into a lot of that stuff at the end, but we also have a 3d swordfish. So the only thing that matters to me is what's the worst thing the house did. I think this one is where it explodes. Well, so we have a blown fuse. We have ghost cold. We have some ghastly moans. Don't forget those. That literally happens. That's true. I thought it was the girl making fun of Mm -hmm. ghastly moans, but it turns out there were really ghastly moans. moans. Um, There's some steam. Oh, you know what? The car fire. That was pretty bad, right? Yeah. Okay. So we need to we need to briefly talk about how the uh, we need to talk about the outsourcing of the (laughs) the demonology of the horror. So the thing about the Amityville house is sometimes it will outsource its mischief, sure, um, to its uh, fly brigade. Uh, that it can spontaneously grow anywhere that there is anything to do with the fucking Amityville house, whether it's post or pre estate sale and the flies can get in your car and then your car is, is under the wrath of the demons from the, whether it's an Indian burial ground or a sacrificial chamber or you killed my puppy. I don't even fucking know exactly why it's evil, but the flies can burn your car. All right, if you don't want to count the flies, then I'm going to count the Lapidus, where we're smashing people down with doors. That's true. I think that might There's be. There's a door smash. There is an actual explosion at the end. The house really blows up. No mm-hmm. fucking kidding blows up. Not like last time, yeah. where there were some explosions that came out of the windows. Yeah, it's the just house the doorways left. And it stays on that for a while. We really see the house go. Drives it home. It is gone. No more house eyes. Until the fourth film, The Evil Escapes. Mm -hmm. And The Evil does escape. Which is funny because we don't know if the third is canon at this point. Right. We don't know if the fourth one is actually Amityville Horror 4 or if they're just calling it Amityville 4 because you can just put a 4 after the name of a town and that's an okay legal grounds. Uh And I mean, the Lutzes, they sued everybody. So I don't know what was going on here. Well, I can tell you what's going on here. Great. So the film starts with a Jason Goes to Hell-esque beginning where... We don't know why the house is back or what is actually going on, but the part that we want to see the most, which is people getting killed in the house, is just ending when we arrive. Right. We arrive to the police arresting the guy or shooting the guy who has killed everybody in the house. Right. Which leaves the house open and again up for sale, but they're not going to furnish it. They're going to sell everything in the estate, including the fucking clearly outdoor front stoop lamp right that seems to be sitting in one of the bedrooms and and if if you're paying close attention you can watch the demon move through the power cable and into the lamp by close attention you mean watching the only thing in the fucking yeah, frame exactly and if you're wondering well come on who's paying for the electricity the house has fifteen hundred dollars so don't make fun of the direction too much it's a made for tv movie and it's made by sander stern who, uh, if you've never heard his name before, is fine because he's the writer of the first Amityville horror movie. I'm going to say right now that despite the fact that I think that this is a gross misappropriation of the (laughs) Amityville name, this is my favorite movie. Ooh, excellent, excellent. I love the fact that you start to see they're scraping the bottom of the barrel to find directors. Yeah. Here we can get somebody who's vaguely attached. They were the writer of the first movie. They didn't write the book. They don't have... I mean, they wrote the first movie. They're the only person they could get back. He's going to go ahead and direct. I like to think that he stepped up to the plate and said, you know what? I will save this franchise. I got a great new idea. So this is where we get this, this thing that becomes the remaining part of the Amityville horror series with the exception of the fifth film. And that's that anything in the house is also evil. Sure, it's part of the house. I so guess. the house has extended itself to the stuff that was in it. So the evil is not just the house. But the things that were in the house while the murders took place. Ah, so you're thinking, 
well, this lamp, I could go back to the first movie and just look for it, right? right? Or maybe it's in the second movie, or maybe they uh-huh. put it in the... The thing that's funny is not only is it a lamp, okay? They chose to go with the lamp, but it happens to be a lamp that didn't even appear right. in the other movies. It's just, it's a it's random lamp. It's very noticeable, too. It's very obvious. It's very ostentatious. It's super ugly. And and I'm going to spoil it. In fact, I'm going to spoil every film right now, except <laughs> for the fifth one. In order to save yourself and your family, right. they just have to break it. Yeah, just break the object. The That's haunted all object. they have to do. Okay, so if I may inject some more skepticism here. Really? You're, gonna, I, you're going to inject skepticism into an evil oh, lamp it's gonna be good. that was shipped to LA and is now torturing a family with its electrical powers? I thought it was shipped to Erie, Indiana. No, no, there was a, there was a layover. If you think about this movie too hard, in fact, if you think about it at all, it forces you to examine your own beliefs about a haunted house. <laughs> I thought you were going to say your own beliefs about a haunted lamp there. I could have said your own beliefs about incest, but we already examined those beliefs. Mm. I really hope someone chaptered over here. So think about this. Maybe you believe in haunted houses, okay? And so I'm not going to mock our audience because I really like our audience. In fact, more than our mutual friends because I'll mock those fuckers. Podmanity is probably my favorite people. And so you think the house is haunted. That's fine. Somebody murdered their entire family. Something very bad happened there. Honestly, I consider myself a very skeptical individual. Being in that house would creep me out a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. It would also be really fucking cool. Yeah. And very often I thought about how cool it would be to host our show from the Amityville house. You know what else is funny? I was excited to come on here and tell you I know somebody who has been to the Amityville Mm -hmm. house, but apparently everybody's been to. Pretty much everyone has been to the Amityville house. Not a big deal. Been by it, drove by it, thrown eggs at it, TP'd. Not a big deal. Taken care of. What I was getting at though is you think this house is haunted. The furniture's still there. It's creepy. That's where the murders took place. But what if part of the house burnt down and they rebuild it? Uh-huh. Does it still have that mystical value? I don't know. I'm not sure uh, what ghosts can survive through. Some movies will have me believe that all you have to do is give it a good vacuuming and right. you'll sure. suck up all the ghosts. Other movie, I mean, if the house is actually built on an Indian burial ground, if you rebuild on it, it's still desecrating it, right? You That's can't one of double the things uh, Kaplan talked about. It's also not built on it. The Indians, they have no idea what they're talking about. The American Northeast was not a big Indian burial ground place. So we know it's not structural support beams in the house, but we tear down, we deconstruct the house piece by piece, and we try and discover, all right, where is, where is the haunting? Where is the evil? Where does it live? Mm-hmm. Does it live in the hole in the basement? Is right. that really where it's at? Sure. Can you take an object? Would one object as absurd as a fucking lamp, would that contain the evil? Mm-hmm. Or do you think a lamp haunting people is a bit too fucking absurd even for you. It's similar to trying to figure out really who a person is. Where the soul lies. Yeah, I guess. Well, not even the soul, just the the identity. Sure. If you got, you know, completely got your face restructured with plastic surgery, clearly still you, right? Sure. If you got your voice changed, clearly still you. Sex change, as far as the podcast is concerned. Definitely still you. Okay. It's a basically, I mean, it tends to come down to you are your brain, right? Yeah. So where's the brain of a house is is the uh, ultimate question. And apparently it lies somewhere in the electrical system. So before we get to the worst thing that the house did, uh-huh. uh, this is starting to remind me of these other slasher movies where the slasher's only in it for two minutes. Sure. You know, those movies that Everything we don't like. Everything after Hellraiser 4. So I'm excited to hear that this is one of your favorite movies. This is my because favorite. Because usually when we only have the slasher for two seconds, you want Jason back. Yep. And you're upset that we only saw the real mm-hmm. Jason in dream sequences. Yeah. Guess which fucking movie that was. But the thing is with this film is I don't think you're married to the house as a slasher. I'm not. The house betrayed me. (laughs) The house has we've covered it, right? What is the house fucking done? It cooked a bird in this movie. Ah, see, but it's not the house. That is my buddy. The old (laughs) Amityville lamp. Okay. But what about move ominously? That's house never did that either. That's what the lamp did. I think uh, for me, it's the garbage disposal. Garbage disposal. That is pretty. So the thing that's weird about the garbage disposal is that. The lamp can't really do anything, and then the garbage disposal plumber man in his jumpsuit shows up and says, well, it's not electrical because you can't move a switch electrically. Right. I like how they really spend a lot of time talking about that switch like that means anything. We were trying to figure out the whole time if it could only do electrical things. Sure, what are the and rules? Trying to, and try to justify how certain things were electrical. Sure. Around the time that the uh, the plumber gets black gooed and then slapped with a severed hand... About that time was when I realized that it's not just electrical. It can it can be your dad, and until you throw it out that fucking window, yeah, right. it's going to persist to annoy you. It's funny, because that was all, what, two minutes after you said, let's see what's not electrical. Mm-hmm. Let's see how to link these things to electricity, and mm-hmm. we hit the plumbing immediately. Yep. 
So it gets back into that house's electricity and fucks with their the uh, the house itself. Sure, because that can't be true because you destroy the lamp and you destroy the evil. Well, right? that's not true. You destroy the lamp and it moves to Sky Pig Cat. Oh my god! It cuts to the cat and zooms in on its face, and then the devil eyes, the red eye, as it's called in the photography field. It comes up and you have credits. Credits over the evil cat eyes. Sky we're Pig serious eyes. about this. Mm-hmm. Amityville Horror 5, The Amityville Curse. Okay. I should uh, note once again that I'm just adding numbers to these. It's right. not actually called the fifth one. But it's from 1990, and it's directed by Tom Barry. So the thing about this film is this is the black sheep. This is the outcast of the entire series. This is the Jason 5. This is the Halloween 3. Well, it's written by no less than, what, four or five people? Mm-hmm. You have the vague tie-in to the book yeah. that the, at this point the movies are just saying inspired by the book sure. or loosely based on the book. The film makes no sense. It has no connection to the other films whatsoever. The only connection is that it takes place in Amityville. Sure. We are not in the house from the first three films. We don't have any belongings from the house in the first three films. It just turns out all of Amityville is evil. Yeah, right. And... I guess the whole thing is kind of Scooby-Doo murder mystery-esque. It is very Scooby-Doo, isn't it? And it comes back around to this weird murder that takes place in the beginning of the film, which by the time the movie starts, I don't remember that happened. No. The only thing this film is to me is Kim Coates from Sons of Anarchy. I love that Scooby-Doo feel. I love that, uh, you know, what's really unique about this movie is that it's a story. You get the, I think of the scene where they're all around the fireplace, right? You get that uh, camaraderie, you get all of the, you know, the kids hanging out around the fireplace, chatting, ghost stories, whatever, spending the night in the haunted house. It goes back to the Vincent Price, Rainy Day Clue episode that we did, and and that feeling you get in so many of those movies. However, these aren't actually kids, they're 30-somethings. Right. Right? They're repairing and trying sure, to resell it, a house. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a real estate move. Right, right. Yeah, so it's the strange mix of Scooby-Doo and... And that scene from American Beauty where she's trying to sell the house. Uh I mean, that's the genetic makeup of this film. And it follows the spooky teenage sort of formula where you go off into these different rooms. Some of them are couples. One is awkwardly maybe kind of attracted to the other one. (laughs) Masturbating. Sure. And that's when the house seizes its opportunity and, you know, stops them from having a shower sex scene. Sure. From being nude, from the, the movie having nudity. Uh-huh. The house, the slasher is really literally stopping nudity from yeah, entering it's ruining the all the franchise. Fun. It's ruining all the fun on both sides of the screen. And so you could tell it's not the main house because the worst thing it can do is break a wine bottle in somebody's yeah. hand. Well, it, it brings us back around to the, the fifth Friday the 13th, where mm. by the end you almost are okay with it almost so we're not because we really like jason yeah but if it weren't jason we're almost okay with it because it's going hey look no supernatural shit Mm -hmm. turns out one of the guys in this house is just a murderer but then you have to go back and look at some of the weird stuff that happens and know the house is also haunted yeah by i guess what the spirit of a priest that was killed in a psychotic rampage like i don't even understand what's possessing dogs that's another staple that comes up is you have uh, these angry dogs in all of these movies uh, possessing animals. It couldn't... See, this is the thing, man. Sky Pig. Just bring back Sky Pig. That's all any of these films needs. Instead, we inhabit a dog. Think about this. Just imagine this situation. You're around a fireplace with your friends, two of whom are going to get naked in the shower and not invite you later, right? And, uh, and so mysterious things are happening. One cuts open their hand. You have kind of an unsettling night, right? You wake up the next day. It's about 6 a.m., you know, 6 in the morning, you open the the shades or whatever, and you look outside not to see daylight, but a rain of fucking terror and a giant flaming pig in the sky with demon eyes. Come on, such a better movie. Amityville number six. It's about time. You didn't give me even an opportunity there, did you? You were really excited for that. This is, this is, I think, I think of all of the Killapalooza titles, this is my favorite one. This is really the worst Killapalooza title of all time. Amityville, it's about time. Amityville, it's about time. Uh, what do you even say about that? Well, the thing that's actually... They we're going to call it Amityville 1992, it's about time. Yeah. How much better of a title is that? That's... Date it just a yeah. little bit more. The thing that's shocking about this film is that you go into it... We were trying to figure out... So we get the title, It's About Time, and before we watch it, we're both going, are they going to time travel? Are they going to finally go to space? Is something going to happen? For space, yeah. Are they jumping the shark in this franchise finally? Turns out... 
it's just they get a clock they get a clock from the Amityville house and that's it's about time and eventually there's some weird time travel thing at the end where baby Rusty decides that it's time for him to venture out and then she gets old in a really disastrous <laughs> uh, special effects yeah, scene. Yeah, it's not so good. But then, By special effects, you mean they just had an older mm, actor play the old version an of her. an elderly woman. But again, so I'm going to just go ahead and spoil it. They break the clock and then they're done. So it sort of slows down time. Don't you remember the moments where time is getting slow and the sound is Yeah, slowing? and then he has like a conversation with a guy about don't have sex with my wife wait did you have sex with my wife i hated both of those guys and by then the they way. wake up from a dream yeah yeah beautiful beautiful every fucking movie wake up from a dream up from a dream have to do it it's tried and true michael it always works mm-hmm. name an instance where wake up from a dream has not worked i'm not gonna i'm not even entertaining that i think we've seen a couple movies where it has worked the second halloween uh that's the, true. the second rob zombie halloween yeah, is but, the only time wake up from a dream but, but that's, see the second rob zombie halloween wake up from a dream isn't Wake up from a dream, psych, that didn't happen. It's wake up from a dream, that not great. Now that you know what happened, it's instead of a, it's instead of a flashback. Yeah, right. It's in lieu of a flashback, you have a you have a night terror about the night it happened. You know what I mean? Only by betraying the mechanism does it become a, a valid uh, thing that you can try and use in your movie. But we do get actual nudity right away. That's true. Some good, sweaty, awkward sex. Very. And this is when the movies realize that they're a slasher franchise. Somebody in the production office probably Christopher DeFaria, says, you like how I'm just going to give him credit? Mm-hmm. Or Antonio Toro, I don't know. It could be either sure. one. They say, hey, we've had six of these movies. This is a slasher franchise. People need to get fucking. Yeah. And so there's some sweaty, awesome sex. Super sweaty. It really is very <laughs> sweaty. That's one of the powers of the house. I actually think this modern house is more terrifying in how tacky and daycare it yep. looks yep. than anything that yep. happened in the actual Amityville house. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing about this film that I just don't really follow is that there is a plot that it, the film seems like it knows that there's an Amityville series mm. going on and that they're kind of ignoring it. So the thing that I found to be the most interesting thing about the film, and they barely gloss over it, is that the father who brings the Amityville clock home also is assigned to do this housing renovation project in Amityville where he's essentially designing an entire town right in a, in the same place that the Amityville horror took place in 1979 that film and it turns out that something possesses him and he ends up designing the same house sure multiple times and I'm thinking in my head wishing that they could have gone to some some fucking place with this film where the house was using a, it possessed a contractor using its last remaining sure. object to rebuild it and rebuild it in greater numbers as a sand people. Sure. That's the cool part of this film is that we have a contractor who's been possessed by the demons of the house to bring it back to life. Right. You know, right. that's the, it's about time for me. Sure. But instead it's about cheating on your husband and infected dog bites <laughs> right. and a son who doesn't like sex. And thusly that makes him an okay protagonist. Don't forget the random swastikas for no yeah. reason. None <laughs> the of swastikas this, are evil. So therefore this film is a bunch of missteps where it just, it it's bounding over the great things it's doing in order to, I guess, make it something that sits really well in 1992. Well, and this can work. We saw this pretty recently in Wishmaster. Yeah. We saw where we get uh, kind of an odd love triangle story. Mm-hmm. We say, I mean, it's, it's actually quite a similar story. And that was something that was very interesting in Wishmaster. I'm not above saying we were just in the right place to watch that movie at uh-huh. that point. Sure. Maybe Wishmaster didn't do anything better than Amityville yeah. did. But uh, for whatever reason, when it happens here, I, I'm i mad. <laughs> yeah. Incest does return, though. So yes, that's kind of interesting. This is the return of incest. And you have the stork kill, which is definitely the worst thing oh, the house does. The stork kill is great. It is pretty great, isn't it? Yeah. But it must annoy you and how it happens outside of the house. It does. And there's no fly present. So in an attempt to outdo the cat ending, this has the titular line at the, the end. The titular line ending. So if you didn't think that it was bad enough, it's about time by the clock and the house coming back and whatever and other day thing. Out. <laughs> Rusty's day out. That is, in fact, a Patrick Reed Johnson reference. Then we get the turn towards the camera and the dramatic, it's about time. Mm-hmm. Uh, next movie. Okay, so this next movie seems like they have 
Not a return to Amityville, not a return to the house, not a return to Sky Pig, not a return to any ideology of the entire series, except a budget. It's one year after the previous film, we're 1993 now, and it's the same producers. It's uh, Christopher DeFaria and Antonio Toro who wrote the movie. Um, I suppose we're the, the writers on the previous one as well, but once again, a different director. And so we have Sky Pig coming back. We have we the do. mirror, yeah, which has at mirror. least the eyes. Yeah. And that's really all we can hope for. We're never going to see a pig in these fucking uh-huh. movies again, but it at least has the eyes. And so this is another one of those movies I have a soft spot for. I think I have a soft spot for it because it's what the Amityville horror would look like if Jeremy Casson did it. It is. It's it's. Got some lofts and some abstract Jeremy tattoo Kasten's art. Jeremy and... Amityville Horror, but it's Amityville Mirror. So this is another one of the relics we have, this twisted mirror, which, by the way, would never be in the Amityville house. No, it's, it's, it's a spooky demon mirror. It doesn't belong mm-hmm. there. It looks, like an, it looks like a Halloween decoration. The idea of Amityville was it was a normal house and somebody went ape shit and yeah. slaughtered everybody. It wasn't the devil's home. Right, right. These weren't Satan worshippers, and here's one of their decorations. But we didn't, you know, we didn't take the twisted lamp to task for that. So whatever. Was the lamp twisted by evil? Maybe that's what happened. See, we actually see the mirror in a flashback and it looks, it's hanging out on the wall and it looks like this. Yeah. I'll accept that the lamp was a totally normal lamp and was twisted by evil. Physically, I mean. Fuck you. (laughs) Let the lamp be. So they head off to the Ground Zero Cafe. I also love Ground Zero Cafe. Ground Zero Cafe. Totally not okay, but it's 1993, so Mm -hmm. it hasn't happened yet. It's okay. And Ground Zero is a pretty generic term. Sure. Still, you could not open a Ground Zero Cafe today. That would not. Eh. Oh, man. And the the cup of coffee has a fucking mushroom cloud coming out. And the guy who works there, you've been to some cafes before. Right. How often do you see the barista stereotype of a guy with a handlebar mustache? (laughs) From Judas Priest. Biker with a fucking... Yeah, that happens all the fucking time. They didn't have hipsters yet, so I guess it's handlebar mustache. I don't think I've ever seen a barista at a coffee shop with a bald head. So maybe the mustache is the wrong thing to look at. Yeah. Doesn't matter. That guy does not belong in this movie. Weird. Also doesn't belong in this movie, Richard Roundtree. (laughs) And a third character? Can we go with Terry O'Quinn? Yeah, weird. So, I mean, Terry O'Quinn we'll hit on in a second. Richard Roundtree, I I don't know, man. This is kind of like Bruce Campbell. I feel like this is the wrong place to even talk about it. We'll do Shaft later. Uh, In the meantime, I think we should just pretend this never happens. No Richard Roundtree. We'll never talk of it again. But Terry O'Quinn is Locke from Lost. Yeah. And uh, is also, is he still doing that J.J. Abrams thing with Michael Emerson? uh, What's it called? Odd Jobs? Is that what it's going to be called? Odd Jobs, yeah. Where there... He was also uh, Howard Hughes in The Rocketeer, I believe. Let's not forget his role in Alias, which aside from Quentin Tarantino is one of my favorite roles Uh in Alias. I watched every one of those fucking episodes. I get to talk about it once in a while. I just have to take my credit, right? I, I'm thinking about the credit I deserve for watching Lost, despite not wanting to for the last three years. Lost ended after three seasons. Oh, that's right. Look, we fixed it, right? Mm-hmm. It ended after three seasons. It's about time. It's Jesus fuck. So Terry O'Quinn has a much higher voice in here. And he does. <laughs> a little bit more hair. Not as much hair as that voice should necessitate, uh-huh. really. Uh, he plays the detective. So this is, I mean, I'm really starting to feel like, I don't know, if this were a Jeremy Caston movie, which one would it be? You mean Who Done It? Oh, you mean which movie? Which movie? Oh, definitely Wizard of Gore. Yeah, right? Because you have kind of the investigation mm-hmm. and the, I was going to say the There's lofts, a gumshoe. But the gumshoe. Okay. There's a gumshoe. That's why. That's why. And the modern art and the suicide girls, not enough suicide girls in this mm-hmm. movie. I think 0% that's- Zero percent suicide It was before girls. the internet. Not even enough suicide, although there's a character that does have- uh, an interesting art setup that would allow for that. She killed herself in the movie, sort of, by demons or something. So Mirrors. let's make her the suicide girl. Right on. There's a sweet Sage Francis reference I could make in here that no one would get. Let's make that time number three, double feature show at gmail.com, if you get sweet Sage Francis references. Okay, so here's the thing we really need to talk about. The Amityville killer turns out to be homeless. Uh-huh. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, DeFeo's still in jail, even today, as we record this, and mm-hmm. I assume by the time it goes up in several days. This is like the least editing time I've ever had on a show. What does Mm -hmm. this go up tomorrow? Next day? Uh, Yeah, I think that's about right. So he's still in jail, and I assume we'll still be in jail two days from now. But the movie says that the killer was released after Reagan stopped funding, Uh and that he has a son that was loose. And so this is kind of a retcon. (laughs) A son that didn't die in the the murder. Although if it were the actual murder we're talking about, the killer was, I believe, one of the sons and didn't have a son then himself. So we're in retcon territory, but I don't think 
I mean, is this the original Amityville murder we're talking about? I don't Are we think saying so. there was another murder in I the think, house? I, well, I mean, the first and second films, also, I guess the third, would have us believe that anytime you move in there, you kill someone, right? But I just assumed we were, there was no history in the house. We were just saying none of the other movies happened. I don't know I don't why know. I made that assumption. I don't either. Probably because the movies assume that uh-huh. I'm going to make that assumption. They say there was one house, some evil happened there, and now there's a bunch of artifacts. Right. So you're telling me that this is one of the other movies, sons, or maybe somebody we never even saw there. story? just one story. of the other people that live there. So somebody went to the house, they went crazy, shot everybody. The police didn't notice that every time they move into this house, some people kill each other. What are they going to do? Fucking cuff the doorknobs? They could change the address. You know, that's another thing I love, is after the Lutzes... Nobody complained of anything weird ever happening. In fact, the the people who've lived there over the years say the only weird things that ever happened was when fucking weirdos who'd seen the movie show up at the house. These are people we know. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess it's a different family. Sure. It's a different set of murders. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a retcon. Well, we can say it is. It doesn't matter. Good point. Doesn't matter. Totally a retcon. So a homeless man happens to be the killer Mm -hmm. who's released uh, from the asylum when Reagan blah, blah, something happened. Mm -hmm. And so he had a son who takes photographs, they meet up, he gives them a mirror. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you smash the mirror. You and smash that's the mirror all and, and the evil, and you don't have to be your father. <laughs> I think one of my favorite parts about this this film is the, the part where he's wielding a shotgun at all these people. Yeah. And the police are trying to stop him. And, this is during the art installation. Sure. And, and Chief Inspector Terry O'Quinn goes, no, 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 I want to see how this plays out. Right. And calls off the police that are trying to get right. him to drop the gun. He's like, no, 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 no. I, I think this is going to go somewhere. Sure. Well, he suspects the evil that might be in the mirror. He sees where this thing's playing uh-huh. out. What do you think this movie's saying about art? Uh, I think that, first off, I think that it's being ridiculously skeptical about how dumb people think things are art that aren't art. Right. But also, I, I don't know, I think it's wrong, and I think that it's overbearing. Doesn't it seem strange, though, for a movie that's created by, obviously, artists, right? Because mm-hmm. people who make movies are inherently art. I use the term art almost offensively loosely. Uh I talk about anything that's made by human beings Mm -hmm. that really doesn't need to be there. Way to defecate, dude. That's art. If you take a picture, that's art. If you, and I know that's really abrasive for some people, especially uh, when I first meet someone or first start talking about them and talk about art stuff, it probably comes off as really pretentious. But what is this show if not a long series of our poor choice in wording and grammar? Absolutely. So maybe we'd call this high art, but at the very least it's art installation. Sure. It's people mocking American Gothic uh-huh. or commenting on that. Sure. And it's showing the masses of stupid people and they show up and yeah. clap. But I'm wondering who writes this kind of stuff. I don't know. I think a lot of people have this kind of, they think that it's really hip that they think certain art is lame. There are people that really take pride in the fact that they can look at something and go, that's not art. Yeah, but artists are like that? I think, yeah. That invoke American Gothic? Wouldn't you go the other direction and try and go as obscure as possible? I don't know. It starts to feel to me like producers. Producers come up with the story. And I guess what I'm saying is I just don't know why you would write about art if you don't give enough of a shit about it to know a whole lot past American Gothic. Yeah. Why would you choose to make that the centerpiece? Probably because they think that they can get people on board to just rally and root against it. You got to get asses in seats. And the way to do that is via a dollhouse. The Amityville dollhouse is the final installment of this poor series, man. All James Brolin wanted to do was create a staple in horror. And the last footprint he ever made in American cinemas was a dollhouse in the middle of a fucking... It's clearly a lot yeah, on some right. fucking studio's <laughs> really is. backyard. Really is. Yep. And there's a dollhouse, and I guess... Okay, so here's the weird thing is, I guess the dollhouse is from the house, or it's just... Now it's a voodoo house. It's a voodoo house, right? Yeah, it's voodoo. You make it to sh- shaped like the evil house, and thusly the evil is incarnated in it. Through the power of voodoo dolls, which contain fly knights. And I'm not saying fly knights like N-I-G-H-T. I'm saying like knights K-N-I-G-H-T. I'm speaking of insects that wield large medieval weapons, large for them. And uh, and they, they uh, incarnate some evil, I guess. And I really didn't realize how little sense this movie made this, until yeah, you started to describe this it. This one is Probably okay, one of the, the most nonsensical films. Let's uh, take a step back here. Why would you have... I, this is where I'm still at, right? Why would you have 
a miniature dollhouse version of your own house inside your house. Well, here's, that's weird. Yeah. Well, and here's here's another thing that I want to I want to speculate. This dude builds his house, right? Sure. Presumably builds every. There's nothing around. Right. This house is in the middle of a canyon. Right. And there is not even a place to raise a child. There are no trees. Right. This is there's nothing there. So he presumably builds the house, builds everything around it, then goes into his shed and goes, huh, how did this dollhouse get here? I don't. Did he? Oh, he did build it. Didn't yeah. He? Because there's all contractor. the jokes about it not being up to code or whatever. Oh, God damn it. So I don't know. I guess the how maybe the shed was there before. Maybe he built it on the same lot. Any of this it's is not a terrible place for a house. Obviously, all his black magic biker friends found it just fine in time for his daughter's birthday party. Sure. So that's true. Or was it son's birthday? It doesn't fucking matter. I think it's a son's. No, it was a daughter. It's 1996. Uh, the last of these movies and in an era where people were still pronouncing the date right. So mm-hmm. that's good. Stephen White directs it. Joshua Michael Stern writes it. I'm still lost back at if the dollhouse was part of the original house, uh-huh. but I don't think that's it. I think mm-hmm. we really want it to be an antique, and I think it's a coincidence. You get a little bit of exposition when they move the dollhouse from their shed that appears on the lot, and there's some kind of article there. I, you know, the thing about the dollhouse is that I'm actually, uh, from a movie-making perspective, I love how convincing the close-up shots of it sure. are. Maybe not the interior, but when they're doing the exterior, uh-huh. I would just totally... Like the fucking house. Yeah, I would buy that. I mean, at least from these shitty movies. I, you know, the, the quality of the movies isn't outstanding. The effects aren't outstanding. Except that one where they blew up the house and they really blew it up good. Yeah, long time. Um, but I would, uh, you know, I would buy that this is the house in, mm-hmm. in, uh, by using the miniatures here. So all of the speculation you or I might have of, well, we really can't get inside the house anymore... Maybe that's why they moved away from it, or we, uh, I mean, we were never really inside the house. No. We were always using a actual exteriors studio. and Mexican sound studio interiors. So I think it's just a change of pace, but it seems so weird to me. I, you know, we joked about this when this Killapalooza was coming up. Whose idea is it to make this movie about a dollhouse? Mm-hmm. Who says that's... I mean, I get Leprechaun in the Hood. Sure. I get that. Absolutely. I don't get Amityville Dollhouse. I think, honestly, I think the only answer to that is find the dollhouse first, Ah. rake in the money after. So somewhere sitting in the props department, they have a model of the house they Mm -hmm. were planning to use for something else or they had already used previously, and they said, hey... Here's a dollhouse shaped like the Amityville Horror yeah, House. Or a super Let's, fan just made it. Sure, that's and, possible. And showed it to some person who told another person about it, who took pictures and put it up on the internet. Although, I don't know. The way they burnt that house in the last scene really felt like victory. We've gotten rid of this shitty prop that's, that's been true. sitting around for so long. That's true. Room for more donuts. Feels like maybe there's a tax write-off in this movie yeah. somewhere. And that kind of reminds me of... Uh, I don't know if you ever saw... I, I'm sure you've heard of it, the Roger Corman Fantastic Four. I've heard of it. Where it's uh, it's an incredibly shitty film. And I guess they had to make it just to maintain the rights uh-huh. so they could hold on to that for later or whatever. It kind of reminds me of that sort of scenario. Yeah. So all speculation aside, we get, we get what is an absolute cop-out return to our only staple in the entire series. So we have this kind of underlying the mom wants to fuck the son incest thing going on super cool except they're not related yeah not as weird so i mean they did this it's dialing down really i don't know if if you're aware of this because i made this reference while we were watching it but in one of the brady bunch movies you talked about this on the show before i've seen the brady bunch movies okay and in one of the brady bunch movies one of the more it's more recent came out probably late 90s early 2ks brad and Marsha, the eldest son and daughter if anybody's not familiar with the story of the Brady Bunch, uh, it's the story of a lovely lady oh God. who is bringing up three very lovely girls. That's really all you can say without us infringing on and copyright. And then there was a guy, and then there's also this father who had three sons. Point is, mother and father each have their own children from previous relationships. Then the father and mother get married, so the brothers are not related to the sisters in any way except their step-siblings, right? Right. So in the film, in one of the film, this is the fucking Brady Bunch, the staple of happy, fun time, family entertainment. Brad and Marsha fuck and end up getting married. Okay. That's how taboo getting, that's how taboo (laughs) incest among step relation is. It's in the fucking Brady Bunch. 
that's no longer like even close to taboo. The Brady it's Bunch is a, a lot weirder out. than I ever sat down to realize it is. Isn't that kind of a weird story? Yeah. But this is coming from the guy who can't understand the dollhouse. So right. whatever, that's fine. So yeah, I can see where you would think the incest thing is a cop out. I'm just glad they brought it back. They sort of realized or maybe it's an accident. Maybe they had no fucking clue and it I just turned out. I think that's the result of just having a family in a house and trying to fuck with them. I think the default is they have to, you have to mess with their head. And the best way to illustrate that is sex. Well, there's some other family stuff going on too. You also have the younger kid who is uh, Tiny Nimoy. Tiny right. Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, he also played Henry in a made-for-TV film starring Sinbad and Ben Savage called Aliens for Breakfast. What the hell is wrong with you? Email me. Double feature show at gmail.com if you've ever seen Aliens for Breakfast. That's number four. So we've reached the end here, and three of the eight movies actually take place in the house. Mm -hmm. Three of the eight fucking movies. The Amityville Horror. Three of the eight movies are in the Amityville house. We have a family story. We have incest. We have a zombie. And we have Zombie Dad, uh, who we light on fire, I guess, the worst thing the house does. <laughs> I guess, Yeah worst thing the house does is is either zombie. well i don't know i guess the worst thing the house does is is have a tentacle reach through the salt light and kill uncle biker it's so weird where that movie ends and they're all inside the fucking dollhouse portals man so much like our other awkward franchises this one stumbles awkwardly out of uh let's call it sky pig's final stand mm-hmm aren't you glad we went through that you know while we were going through it, I wasn't. I was I was horribly upset. I was disappointed. I was tired. We had to start early. These were eight movies. This yeah, is the most did. Killapalooza sure. work we've had to do in a long time. Yeah, it is. And I thought uh, we were lowering the requirement, right? not lowering the and, standard. But, but now, having discussed it, I feel like we've actually done people a service. Well, and it's just another point of comparison. Why yep. not have it? Yeah, and I think I think that I, I, I honestly don't expect any of Podmanity to have watched these eight films. But I do expect that you all fucking listened to this entire show, and now you can pretend you've seen all the movies. Glorious. And at least in that realm, we're doing somebody a service, right? These people are doing themselves a service, because I imagine we're going to talk about Sky Pig every five minutes yeah, from here on, and true. no one's going to have any idea. Uh -huh. I actually really want to make double feature shirts that say Sky Pig. I think that that would be fantastic. I don't even know if they should say double feature on them anywhere. I think maybe they should just say Sky Pig. Well, maybe, I don't know. Would you buy a double feature shirt if it had something to do with Sky Pig? Double feature show at gmail.com. We also have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. And uh, some updates on some different stuff. So Audible has the Amityville Horror Book. Mm -hmm. um, what is bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com? Bookshow right? So you can get that for free. Uh, if you listen to that, the audiobook, or if you read it, I do actually report back in. Because uh, I'm kind of curious about, you know, about the actual book and how stuff's portrayed in there. And uh, we'll fucking put your email on the year-end show. So we're going to kind of revisit this. If you end up listening to the audiobook, send us an email. We'll stick it on the uh, the end of the year. While we're talking about the end of the goddamn year, which for us ends in what? June? July? Is that how I our, think, yeah, I think it's about June. The end of our show works. I realize I just keep saying things like the end of the year and no one has any right. clue uh, what we're talking about. The donation thing where we let people pick out the movies and they mm -hmm. pick a bunch of shitty Michael Bay movies. Mm -hmm. That yeah, thing funny joke. actually, <laughs> please don't do that. Whatever. They can do whatever they want. We agreed to this. Um... That's going to end next Killapalooza. Next Killapalooza. So next time a Killapalooza is coming up, that'll be the last time we're taking in any donations. Yeah, we don't want your money after that day. So fucking Apparently. do that. Well, we got to cut it off at some point and get ready and watch movies and whatever. Uh -huh. So donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Right. Time is finally fucking running out. It's about time. You know, I didn't make one fucking Joss Whedon reference during the entire Dollhouse section. Yeah. And so you have to stop making it's about time jokes. With all that said, um, I think glittermouse.com is the uh, where that video is going to go up. That's going to be there. Um, it'll be on our website somewhere. Cool. I'll link somehow. I don't I don't know. I have two days to figure this shit yeah, out. Yeah, that's cool. And we'll put it on YouTube. And YouTube. It'll be around. People will see it. Yeah, go on our Facebook absolutely. page. You'll see it. Go on the double feed. You can also go on the Glittermouse Facebook page. I'll put it up there too. Everywhere. Across the entire internet. Uh, go easy on me though. This is the first actual final cut thing that I have edited. The last time I put out that Birthday Massacre DVD, believe it or not, that was all using QuickTime, I think QuickTime 6, QuickTime 7, wow. and iMovie. For that exact reason, I didn't want to use Final Cut. It terrified me. And uh, it's awesome, but it's still kind of terrifying. 
What are we doing on the show next time? I still don't have that answer. It's been an hour. You're obviously very tired. Uh-huh. We're doing Django and uh, help Sukiyaki me with that. Sukiyaki Western Django. What was that again? Sukiyaki Western Django by Takashi Miike. Oh my God. The first part is what I... It's mm-hmm. Sukiyaki yes. Western mm-hmm. Django. Right. So not Django, but Django. Just Django. Westerns, Takashi, Django, good time. Watch more fucking film. Bye. The thing I love about incest. That just came right out of my mouth, didn't it? That's everyone's new text message tone. Oh, God.